Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Shabbat Shalom. This uh, parasha is the, 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 we are almost closing the Shemoh HaSefer, the book of Exodus. We are almost at the end. And this is a very interesting chapter that we, are, we have been looking to see it. It is not the most positive, it is not, not the most exciting in the sense of what Israel accomplished. It's totally the contrary. It is a, in certain ways, it's a very hard chapter because here we are going to see one of the greatest sins of Israel. The, the, uh, the Eger Mashachet, the, the Eger, the, um, the, the, um, the, what do you call it, uh, the young cow, the, how do you call it? The, yeah. the calf, the golden calf. Thank you. The golden calf is the, the one that is going to play an important role. Our sages and our rabbis, they have made many interesting uh, midrash, midrashim about this episode. But first of all, I need to give you only a little background about where we are right now. You know, this is a period that you, you have read your scriptures, you're going to go through um, chapter 24 at the end of the book of Shemot, and you're going to see something very interesting. At the end of the chapter 24, we read as follows. <clears throat> no, we read as well. Uh, just before a... a This in, from verse 9 he said, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihud, and 70 of the elders of Israel ascended. And they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet was lightness, a sapphire brickwork, and it was like the essence of the heavens in purity. Against the great men of the children of Israel, he did not stretch out his hand, they gazed out, gazed at God, and yet, they ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, Ascend to me to the mountain and remain there, and I shall give you the stone tablets and the, and the teachings and the commandments that I have written to teach them. Moses stood up with Joshua, his servant, and Moses ascended to the mountain of God to the Elders, he said, wait for us here until we return to you, behold our own and her. And with you, whoever has grievance should approach them. Moses ascended the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord rested upon the mountain of Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six day period. He called to Moses, and on the seventh day, in the midst of the cloud, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the mountain before the eyes of the children of Israel. Moses arrived in the midst of the cloud and ascended the mountains, and Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay? Then there is a, like a stop there and change totally the discourse of uh, Shemot, or Exodus. Then we go to chapter 31, verse 18. This is when we continue chapter 24. Okay? And then he say here, chapter 20, chapter 31, 18. That's where we want to start the reading again. When he finishes speaking to him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets of testimony, a stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. What is interesting, we just finished in, in chapter 31, 17 about the Shabbat. Then in the Masoretic uh, way of writing the Torah, there is, the, there is a space of division and it's called Setumah. 
and then there is a settlement, and then uh, the problem here is that these divisions were done by the Christians, and they sometimes they didn't choose the best way to to divide the scriptures. Maybe because they didn't know too well the uh, the Hebrew language, or they didn't know how to divide it, but they divided the wrong way. We are going to see many times this problem. Uh, and uh, they, in the Setuma, is in verse 18. I mean, the chapter 31 needed to start with verse 18. No, even that you're going to see uh, a little bit more uh, 30, 32 start in the next uh, verse. But these two needs to be one in agreement with the other. And I'm telling you, look at the jump. You have from chapter 25 to chapter 31, 17. It's talking about the Ohel Moed, the construction of the same, and the furniture that you want to have inside, some of the, the, uh, the attire of the high priest, and different uh, instructions. Suddenly, if you go to the end of chapter 34, instead of chapter 35, we, again we begin with the construction of the Ohel Moed, the, the Ten of Meetings, uh, sometimes repeating some of the things before um, and elucidating a little bit more certain areas. Now, there are sages that they're trying to defend that, you know, this is the idea about how many times I have told you that you do not need to defend God. You know, and sometimes they think that you have the, in the portion here that some people say, you see here there is a mistake. Uh, and look, at he jumped from chapter 24 and then go to 25, look like that there is no connection one with the other. Uh, this is not chronological. When there is a saying among the sages too, that God not only speaks with the language of men, that we're going to see certain things here, but also God is not tied to time. You know, what he teaches you, he's going to teach you according to the principles and the values of the, the things that he wants to convey to you. You know, and sometimes he comes young from one side to the other to convey a meaning. Now here, the question is, why our creator uh, editorialized, let me put it that way, with Moshe Rabbeinu, in this way, why he put from chapter 3, 25 to, to 31, 17, and then from chapter 35 to 40, again about the Ohel Moed. The Ohel Moed, okay? And then one of uh, one of the things here that is very important is what is the purpose? <coughs> what our creator wants to convey. No, uh, when you become literalist, when you become letter by letter, word by word, you constantly miss the point. You know, I have seen, for example, in other religions, especially in Christianity, when I was studying with them, you know, it is unbelievable the efforts that they put in letter by letter, you know, to the point they become puntilious, and, you know, punctual, and, and they lose the whole picture of the, of the message, you know, because they become so concentrated in one letter, in one word, that they miss the whole message. You know, how many times I have been teaching you that the, 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 word, the word that God has revealed to us Blessed be his name. You know, it's like a mosaic, a beautiful mosaic, made of little pebbles and little colors. They are put there, you know, in such a way that you are going to see the whole picture only when you take a step back, not when you be going so close that, that you cannot see the message. You know, and this is the problem of many of us. Because our mentality, we live in the, what I call it, in the Western civilization, the Western philosophy way of seeing and looking. We are always, we are uh, magnifiers, trying to look the little detail and losing the big, big 
uh, example. You know Yeshua, only to understand this, our Messiah Yeshua. <coughs> Look at what a beautiful message that he does. You are so worried about the little thing about the eyes of your neighbor, <laughs> and you have lost the big log that you have in your own eyes. This is the idea. Okay? Look at the mentality that we are approaching. The mentality is trying to cut the little pieces instead to look at the message. Now, what will be the reason of this type of editorial and uh, putting this message in the middle? Why didn't go directly from chapter 24 immediately to the golden calf and then after that the building of the Ohemoe, the thing of meeting? No, there are many answers and many ways to, to say it. Most of us will agree on this. There was a way to envelope, envelope, to envelop the sin of the golden calf. You know, almost to cover the shame of the Israeli people. Now, one of the questions that you're going to see here about the golden calf is how could be that a people that have just been rescued from an amazing way, you know, in a miracle way, from a great empire like the Egyptian empire, with the Pharaoh and all the, the warriors and, and soldiers and everything, army that they had, and these people that they never learned yet to defend themselves. And God was Adonai Sebaot, the God of the armies, was defending them and covering them with a multitude of miracles, the place and all the things that they had already been witness of. Not only then, when we're going out, the crossing of the Red Sea, and then the, these miracles of getting water and, and getting food from nowhere, all those miracles. Even the complaint after complaint, but I'm God was gracious with them, giving to them everything that they needed. And you see here a very interesting leader, Moshe Rabbeinu. I call him Moshe Rabbeinu the reluctant leader. You know, remember, he, he didn't give himself, he didn't uh, say, I want to serve you. He never said, I offer my service to you. He never said, you know, he never volunteered himself. Totally the contrary, if I can imagine Moshe Rabenu, Moshe Rabenu was like, don't push me, don't push me, don't push me. You know, was just the opposite. He was trying not to serve our Creator. He, one after the other, was looking for excuses or ways to get out. And finally, the Creator said to him, shut your mouth and do what I tell you to do. You know, and he didn't need to shut to his mouth. According to the tradition, he had a problem with his, uh, what do you call it? Ta -ta 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 -ta. No, stutter. What do you call it? Stutter? No? And, um, and then he put his own brother, Aaron. And we are going to see Aaron today. Okay? His oldest brother, three years older than him, and you know poor Aaron. They, to Aaron, they gave a job that was too big for his own. You know, but we want to see this. Because we need to see the Torah. In the way that has been given to us, not in the way that we want to magnify it. Our Creator was so wonderful to show us that our people, our heroes, were human like anybody else. Were not greater than anybody else, were very human. And then they become, they took the job and they needed to grow and very fast. You know, people say, oh, if, if God was with me, like if, uh, God was with Moshe, I would be a, a great hero. Uh, everybody can be a great hero when he's not there, you know? But the truth of the matter is, took a time. Then, here this is going to happen something. And I'm going to develop my own theory, if you call it, or my own understanding. Okay. I have read many, many Midrashim, but to me I think 
this is the way that I see it. And um, not everybody has looked at that way, and I think a very few people maybe has even mentioned that. And it is in this way. You need to read again. In chapter 24, Moshe Rabbeinu is to totally excited. The people are excited. They have received the, the Ten Words of the Ten Commandments. They have been in that they have had the greatest theophany that they could have. They have seen the power of God. And now the leader is going up to the mountain to receive the tablets. But well, that is so amazing. The people were excited about those things that were going to happen. You know? The problem is that they didn't know how long they were going to be. Okay? Now, listen carefully to this. Do you think a person can survive 40 days and 40 nights without any water or no drinking? Usually the people will be dead, especially in that area. You know? Hot, deserted, all of those things. Now, then, for the people of Israel, after a while, to think that Moshe Rabbeinu had died was no uh, something impossible to believe. Then, they try to, to see what is going to happen to them. If the leader has gone, we need another leader. But to me, the question is, well, if I need another leader, I have to hear the brother, Aaron, or I have to hear Hur, you know? Because he leaves both of them, Moshe Rabbeinu, to substitute him when he is away. You know, that would be the simple, but I know they need to look for something else. What is telling you there? Already, you can see that uh, it, it, a team that I constantly develop with the time. Our creator was, was ready to get the people of Israel out of Egypt. But he didn't get Egypt out of Israel. Start thinking about yourself now with this idea. How many of us we say that we have started a new life? We have a new beginning. Oh, I have changed my way of, of doing things. You know? Everything is external. Everything needs to see, everybody needs to see it. How good and how wonderful you are. You have changed. Okay? But why you are really inside? How much have you changed inside? Or you are still carry on the past, the old being? Huh? This is the idea that I want that you start uh, putting in, 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 your, in your mind. Now, let's look also to Moshe Rabbeinu. Remember what I have told you. Moshe Rabbeinu is a reluctant leader. Until this moment, he has been following the rules and regulations of our Creator. He has followed them. Okay, you put me in that job, I want to do it. You know, when he was, when the, uh, the Egyptians were going to they catch Israel, and they saw in front of the, on the sea, he was shaking, you know, what we are going to do here? You know, what God said to him, shut your mouth, look at them, and don't open your mouth, wait and let them cross. How are you going to cross? Don't worry, do this, and he follow, and that happens. He continues doing the same thing, obeying what a creator tells him to do. And he started getting one after the other. Now with the excitement, they are the over the excitement, the party is over, and they have been, he has been in the mountain. You know what it means for you to be in the mountain with the presence of our Creator? Anybody will tell you that it is the most beautiful and exciting thing. You know, uh, in certain way, but very limited way, I can even Imagine what Moshe Rabbeinu did. You know, two years ago, I almost I died. And I had an experience, you know? And that experience had marked me after that. And, and I said to, to some of the people that started asking me questions, I said, you know, 
I think I was in the other side. Maybe it's my mind, but I don't, I don't want to argue with anybody about it was or it was not. That was my experience. You know, I won't, I won't uh, try to force anybody to believe me. Only I'm telling you what I experienced or what I thought I experienced. But the one thing that I remember very clear, the other side was so wonderful that he didn't want to come back. Can you imagine our prophet, our teacher, our rabbi, Moshe, who God is in the presence of the Creator, and he doesn't want to leave us. He is too, too enjoy too much. This is really life in abundance. And time can pass, but I am not in a hurry to go back. He forgot even to eat. He didn't need to eat. In the presence of our Creator, you don't have any need. But suddenly, let me read to you. And when he finished speaking to him, that is our Creator, the Mount Sinai, he gave to Moses the two tablets, testimony, desert, he went to pick it up. And he said, you know, the stones that are inscribed, and this is an anthropomorphism, that, remember I tell the Torah is speak in the language of men, with the fingers of God. That's what the scriptures say. You know? Uh, the, 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 the Esbat Elohim. With the fingers of God. I mean, he put the, the tablets. A beautiful writing, I imagine. Be beautiful calligraphy. And Moshe Rabbeinu is so excited with these tablets. Continue. Verse 1, chapter 32. The people saw that Moshe had delayed. Okay? Now they are doing a parallel. This is here, I am in the mountain, but now we, we go back to the camp. This is at the end of the 40 days. The people saw that Moses had delayed in descending the mountain. And the people gathered around Aaron. Now here comes big brother Aaron. Okay? And said to him, Raise up and make for us gods that will go before us. For these men these men, Moses, who brought us from the land of Egypt, we do not know what became of him. Now, understand this about these people. These people, they haven't got it yet. Okay, this is important. We are, we are, we are very quick to judge others. But you need to remember that sometimes you, make, you need to make a judgment or to make an appreciation about how much the other people understand or not. You cannot require the same understanding to somebody who, who never had, had an education with somebody who has education. Okay? Because it, it's a different understanding. More simpler you are, more simpler understanding you have, more basic understanding you have. And you have been influenced by another group, another civilization. But you come from the other civilization where there are a lot of people who believe in anything and they have many gods and they have anything that, and they can make a god in a simple time. And, but for them it was nothing unusual. The problem here is not them. The problem is Moshe David. The problem here I see is Aaron, the brother of Moshe. Our sages are very nice to Aaron. Okay? Because this is the problem that we face when we become partial to something and we are not objective. You will be surprised. In, in the in the Midrashim, in the in the portion of uh, Rabat Shemot, okay, that is the Midrashim. How 
they try to clean Aaron and they blame Yerek Rab for this. You know, you remember in chapter 12 of the, the, the book of Exodus, verse 38, they say that the, the people of Israel, they left, and they left with them in Ereb Rab, a mixed multitude. In other, in other words, they came the other people that were not like us. And this is the other people who made us a mess. Because we were good. The problem we were, we were not us. The problem were them. We keep doing the same thing that Adam and Eve. We have no change. We have no progress. We have not evolved. We are still the same people. You know, we keep always blaming the others. And then the idea here, they develop this idea that the Israelis couldn't never do that kind of idolatry. They were pushed. Now, but as you keep reading, you are going to see that the real leaders of who died were Jews. But Israelis. Not the Arab. The question is why they didn't kill Aaron. Okay? This is a very interesting thing to think. Well, look at what he said. Aaron said to them, Remove the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, sons, and daughters, and bring them to me. By the way, many people think a man using rings today and uh, is something that is new. You know? At that time, men also used rings. Sorry to tell you, but that's true. <laughs> Here's it. That doesn't mean that that is something that Israeli would tell you to do. That was from the other nation. That was the culture at the time. You know, little by little, men start getting a little better. But that, that was the time. The entire people removed the gold ring that they were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And here they tell us that men also has earrings, you know. I don't know on the left or on the right because today is, you know, it has a meaning, you know. Sometimes better you put it both sides, you know, that way nobody doubts about you. Anyway, uh, the entire removed the rings of their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took it from their hands and bound it up in a cloth and fashioned it into a molten calf. And they say, and they say, this is interesting. From the singular, third person, go to the third person plural. And they say, they say. In other words, is making a distinction. It's not Aaron who is saying this, but the people of Israel. And they say, this is your God, O Israel. Like Shema Israel. Can you, can you believe? Look, look at what he says in verse uh, 3. Uh, in verse 3, okay? He said, um, And then they say, In the land of Egypt, Here we read, here. That's that you know, give you even understanding the comparison now uh, you're going to see in the Varin in Deuteronomy with the Shema. And, and the idea it is what are we are getting here? If you look very careful the, the chapters in the Varin, Moshe Rabbeinu is giving his own opinion. And when you read this portion, you need to read it especially with chapter nine of the Varin and to compare, because there's two ways to see it. This one is related from the, from, from the side of God's point of view, and on the other side is from Moshe's point of view. And you're going to see the contrast. In the other one, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu said that, that he needed to intercede for Aaron for, being, for, for him not to be killed. Here doesn't say anything, but uh, in the Varin, uh, clearly, 
uh, Moshe Rabbeinu say that he interceded. Aaron was going to be killed too. Okay? But he was not because of Moshe Rabbeinu's intervention. This is another principle that we can learn from the Torah about that there is merit. Indeed, our fathers, they merit in the righteous people. That's the reason that we have merit in our Messiah Yeshua. You know, uh, there, is, there, there is an idea there that, that we can check. Now, uh, and they say, here, the here, O Israel, has brought you out from the land of Egypt. That golden calf is going to be coming now. The God of Israel. Kind of strange. Our, our sages, they say, no, they, they, were not, they were not replacing God, they were replacing Moshe Rabbeinu. Whatever they replace it, the statement is very clear. Okay? Aaron saw and built an altar before him. Before what? Before the, this uh, calf. Aaron. Um, Aaron called it out and said, A heart for the Lord, a festival for the Lord, will be tomorrow. Our saying say that he was making time. And he said, Moshe, hurry up, Moshe. I am getting in trouble, Moshe. <laughs> Please, help me. Help me. I don't know what to do. You know, the question is, why in that moment Aaron and Hur and the, the others say, this is not right. We are in silence there. We can speculate a lot of things, but we need to look at what we have here. Um, he said, and Aaron saw and built an altar before the night called it. And they arose early the next day and offered an elevation offering, a broad peace offering, and the people sat eat, and they got up river. You know? Uh, let me see here something that... There were, uh, I don't know, in other, in other uh, version, what is the translation that you, you have, but the term is les ahek, that come from, you know, to, to be enjoying, uh, uh, to be happy, or to, to do things strange, but also has a connotation, by the way, the uh, yihak, could come from that root, but all because Hebrew is very interesting. But also, here has a connotation according to the Hebrews that they has a term of a licentious uh, life style. In other words, there was an orgy. Look to which level they has descended the people of Israel, no? The Lord spoke to Moses, verse 7, and spoke, Go descend for your people, that you, and this is a very interesting uh, dialogue. Now, now let me talk about the dialogue between our Creator and Moshe Rabbein. And then I, time, oh, time is gone. I need to finish uh, a, a quicker change, okay? Because the, the most important part, I, can, I cannot leave it out. I explained too much time in something else. Okay. Go the same for the people that you brought out from Egypt and have become corrupt. What is interesting here is say, Ki chihet imecha. Your people. God is telling Moshe Rabbeinu, your people. Okay? They have stayed. They are corrupted, you know? God has sent you people, your people have been corrupted. They have stayed quickly from the way that I have commanded them from, and that's true because the second commandment that he gave it, the ten words, is against idolatry. Very often, don't make image or likeness about me. And they have made themselves a molten calf, prostrated themselves to it, and sacrificed to it. And they say, 
Decís your God, oh Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. He repeated what we already saw. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen these people, and behold, they are in a stiff neck. Keshef Orev. You know, a stiff neck. You know what I mean, a stiff neck? Yes. You know? Okay. And now, desist from me. Let my anger flare against them and shall annihilate them and I shall make you a great nation. Let's tell it to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu until the moment was excited about these people and suddenly <coughs> the, oh, his spirit. Look at Moshe Rabbeinu's answer. Moses pleaded before the Lord, his God, and said, Why the Lord should your anger Fred against your people <coughs> at the call of the ping pong dialogue. It's your people or my people? You people. No, no, no. I didn't ask them. You gave it to me. Take it back. They are both of them. No. She looks like a, our creator has sense of humor. But supposedly he's upset. What is my point of view? And you can read the rest for yourself because the time has come and I need to finish. <laughs> and here is my point. Okay? Moshe Rabenu, at this moment, has the time of reckoning with his people. Until this time, he had been saying, you put me in this job, I didn't ask you to do this, I didn't want to do it, I am being pushed to do it. Suddenly, when our creator promised him, I'm going to destroy all of them, I'm going to give you new people. Well, wait a minute, a new people? This is my people! We all the problems, but it's my people. It's, you know, it's like if somebody uh, uh, to, to parents, uh, that they have very, very rebellious children. You know, uh, somebody come and say, you know what, I kill your children and give you two more. You know? Okay. <laughs> okay. The parents say, you know, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, maybe some parents would say, okay, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but uh, can you imagine? Say, I want to switch you, I want to, go to give you new, new children. And finally, Moshe Rabbeinu reacts. And what in his reaction, what he does? He finally appropriates the people of Israel as his own. And he was willing to suffer for his people. That is totally identification. You know, I, I call it here the true love of Moshe Rabbeinu for his people. He was willing to die for his people. Later on, you're going to see here, he said to our Creator, even, first of all, the people say that, look like here that Moshe Rabbeinu is very smart and convinced our Creator to change his mind. <laughs> You know, there is the idea of people that think God is a wishy-washy God. You know, that, I, you know, I am so smart that I want to convince him. And there are several parts in the scripture that you, you want to see um, um, our creator change his mind. But you need to look at it from the perspective it is he had the same situation with, uh, uh, with Abraham Abino and with others, you know, he changed his mind. Or he allowed the people to appropriate and to plead the cause. You know, in, in, the, in the Tanakh he say that God reveals his way to the prophets, the people that he loved. And here God is going to tell Moshe Rabbeinu about this special thing about Israel. But it's giving to, to him the opportunity to decide it. They are really my people, or they are not. 
and once he appropriates the people of Israel, what he does is that he gives completely to these people. And he has nothing to do, this is important, because true love, and I can keep teaching you about this, this, this statement, true love it is not about what I receive, true love is about what I give. You know, when you truly love someone, it's not what you're expecting to receive back. It is to give. This is the problem of today. That we have, the, I call it the Hollywood love or the type of love that is always love is what I can get from the other person who I love. You know? Uh, the idea it is, I love you because you give me. I love you because I get this from you. I love you because I receive this from you. You know? And true love it is totally unselfish. True love needs to be unselfish. And true love doesn't mean about feelings. True love means about doings, actions. This is the true Ahava. Then, when you say to, to, to your girlfriend, to your boyfriend, to whatever friend that you have, and you say, I love you, be sure that you mean it. Be sure that you are saying, I care so much about you, that to me, the most important thing is you, not me. And uh, uh, it's not uh, the reason that I want to keep you alive, there are many people that are like that, by the way. To me, it's important that you are still alive because what I can get from you. Instead to say, I want that you live a, a fulfilled life. Moshe Rabbeinu understood finally about his role <coughs> as the leader of Israel. His people were not a perfect people and need to go through a lot to the point that the second generation to need to wait until the second generation to be able to go to the promised land. What the trip was going to be only 11 days resulted in a shortcut of four years, you know, and was eliminating totally one generation because that generation was not going to be good to go to the other side. Why? Because they were not able to get rid of Egypt. Let me go back to the beginning where I start about reluctant leader and what we are taking out of it. The golden calf is still in all of us. I am not saying in you, I say in all of us. And we are struggling with the golden calf. We are struggling with materialism. We are struggling with selfishness. We are struggling with pride. Well, if he is not with us, we make somebody else. We don't need it. We can do it in our own. This is totally spiritual pride. And the material pride it is, if I fill my pocket with material things, you know, my God becomes the golden calf. I finish with this. One time I was in Israel and I remember taking a taxi and I started talking to the taxi and the taxi was a, a very interesting personality. And one of the things that he was telling me about Israel, because I was asking how Israel is doing and this, he said, we are still the same. I said, what do you mean? We are still worshipping the golden calf. You know, it's very sad. When a nation, it's very sad when we as group of individuals, we have put our eyes in the things that we can touch and we have lost our way to our creator and we have lost the idea about what true love and dedication means for our people. I hope that everybody
receive this message in the right way and give you Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat.